be. All right, thank you so much folks for joining us tonight. Um, we'll just take a moment as um, people are joining the conversation. Um, but yeah, thank you so much attendees. Um, it is a busy week in Berkeley. Um, high school has started its first week um, and college students are moving back to campus campus start classes start set next week right so um there's lots of uh folks moving in parents too it's, it's just great to see people um in our town um our library um all of our library branches have reopened to the public um the central public library we're really excited um to have um our four floors including our new teen area and our new mystery reading room space um so i encourage everyone to visit and um check out the library too it's great to be browsing to be able to browse sh shelves again um so uh but for the time being, we are planning to continue um, popping the science bubble on Zoom. Um, there will be updates if we plan to switch to in-person, but currently right now, we've just talked about doing the running the program online. Um, so, all right. Um, for those just attending, um, going to note that the program is being recorded right now um, and will be uploaded to um, popping the science bubbles YouTube page. And it is also being live streamed on Facebook. And as a side note, we are also very excited that the library is back in action. Thank you. All right. Uh, I think I'm going to take us away with an introduction. Um, welcome to Popping the Science Bubble. This is a monthly seminar series that aims to share new research findings from grad students and postdocs at UC Berkeley with the general public and create constructive discussion about a variety of science topics. We have two speakers at each seminar who will talk about their current research or a topic that they just find really interesting. The organizers are three graduate students at UC Berkeley Jenna, Madison, and Oksana. If you're interested in checking out their past seminars, you can visit their website. Uh, their website also has information um, about upcoming seminars when you're looking at what's next month by month. Um, and you can also visit their YouTube channel um, where we upload previous seminars. Um, so thank you so much for attending and it is an absolute delight to host Popping the Science Bubble, and I will let the team take it away to introduce tonight's speakers. Thank you, Kelsey. Um, as Kelsey said, we're uh, Popping the Science Bubble, grad students uh, at UC Berkeley, sharing research uh, from on campus with the community. Uh, we're here every third Tuesday of the month, currently virtually, maybe at some point before the end of this year, going hybrid in person while also streaming. Um, but that's to be announced whenever that happens. Um, uh, but for tonight's talk, of course, we're virtual, uh, which means that all questions are uh, can be asked in the chat and Q&A as the talk goes on. We'll be monitoring them in order to ask our speakers. So feel free to ask any questions as they pop up uh, and we can make sure to facilitate that. Um, but the first speaker that we're really excited for tonight is Anna Sharnagal. Uh, she grew up in sunny South Florida and spent a good portion of her youth and early career sloshing about in the Everglades uh, and received a Bachelor of Sciences in Biology and a Bachelor of Arts in Religious Studies from Florida International University. Um, Anna has been fascinated by interaction since she was little, so unsurprisingly focused her master's research on catechid communication in tall grass prairies in the Midwest. Uh, now, she's a PhD candidate at UC Berkeley, where she continues to study interactions, this time between plants uh, and their associated microbes. And Anna is an outdoor girl, through and through, spending her free time hiking, gardening, bird watching, and generally enjoying the view, uh, and also enjoys culinary exploration, whether in her own kitchen or through her taste buds at various entries. She is an artist and has photographed or drawn all of the images used tonight. So we're super excited to see those and excited to hear her talk. 
So I will uh, stop sharing the screen. Anna, you are free to share yours and please take it away. Thank you very much. Let me see. Only been doing this, I don't know how long, so we'll see if we can do this successfully. Okay, can we see my screen and all is well? Yes, all is well. Okay, so uh, tonight I'm happy to talk to you about my PhD research, which is looking at friendships across space and time. Uh, what I, the friendships I'm referring to are between the things we can see, plants around us, and their microbial partners. So to get into that, what are microbial partners? What are microbiomes? Well, we've probably all heard of microbiomes generally. Uh, even if we haven't heard the term microbiome, we've heard of, you know, advertisements on TV, Facebook, otherwise saying, you know, have some kombucha, have some kefir, have some yogurt with your probiotics in it. Probiotics are so good for your gut. And now I don't really want to delve into the human side of microbiomes because, there's still an area with a lot of research to it, and I'm not here to vouch for whether or not probiotics are a pro or a con. But the gist of what I would like to get across is, yes, we are all covered inside and out with microbes. Who are these characters? And all of us being all of us that we can see and interact with, but also all other living organisms and including plants. So given that, um, we all have uh, microbiomes and well, it seems like the research is pointing to the fact that these are very beneficial. They're good for keeping good immune function and good gut health. Who's inside the plants? Now, this is a, a really, really random smattering of characters here um, and not fully representative. There are a lot of different groups of bacteria, archaea, and um, fungi that are all found in the microbiome. But I just have a few characters here, uh, a couple classic players, and then a few that just happened to be from things I was looking at recently. So one of the main things that we hear a lot about is something called arbuscular mycorrhizal fungi, or AMF for short. And the actual fungi is just this little thread right here. And this thread is going into uh, and creating an interface with a plant root. So this is a very, very zoomed in picture of a plant root. Um, you know, you might be able to see this with your naked eye. It would be a very small hair-like root and an even smaller little hair-like thread. Um, and that interface is where there's a lot of exchange of nutrients. So most of these uh, characters that are found predominantly in the soil have relationships with plants that at the front end of it, is an exchange of nutrients. Plants make sugars, which lots of bacteria and fungi just love sugar, um, don't we all? But these characters help to take certain nutrients like nitrogen and phosphorus from the environment that in the environment it's in a state that the plant can't directly uptake and they break it down and fix it and make it such that the plants can actually uptake them. So some of the other characters on here are non-fungi. The rest of these little guys, uh, all the way down to uh, Veracu microbia, are all bacteria. So fungi, before moving to the bacteria, is like us in that um, it can be in kingdom animalia or um, kingdom fungi. You can have um, uh, multi-celled organisms or single-celled organisms, but our cells are big and have organelles inside of them. Uh, we're called eukaryotic. Um, and then the bacteria and the archaea, they are much smaller uh, and they do not have organelles. Little things that are inside of them uh, organized in a certain way with little membrane uh, membranes binding the different compartments inside of their cells. So they're all single-celled organisms, very, very tiny, um, and they don't have individual compartments inside uh, that are bound with membranes. So bacteria, the firmicutes, they're pretty abundant. Um, one of the most abundant ones in the soil, but they have a, um, a small component for the microbiomes. Bacteroidetes, whew, these guys, they're found in just about every single microbiome you can come across. Um, and they help down, break down polysaccharides. So um, things that are like glycans and stuff. Um, 
might have heard of polysaccharides. Those are also uh, things that make up some of the foods we break down. Um, actinobacteria uh, grows pretty much everywhere and was originally thought to be a fungus because it grows in very long thread-like colonies that make it look kind of thread-like, like a fungi. Of which, just a note too, we're used to seeing the mushrooms and things like that that we call fungi above ground. Those are their fruiting bodies, just like um, apples or pears or peaches. Um, but the actual body of a fungus is usually all of these massive threads underground or in a substrate such as uh, inside of rotting wood or uh, a rock or something. Um, and a couple of these other characters are pretty interesting. These guys are found pretty deep down in the soil, um, but they uh, definitely help to break down certain nutrients and provide it for upper layers of the soil. These are very common in um, uh, microbiomes. They are involved in multiple nutrient cycling things. So you probably have heard of carbon cycle, nitrogen cycle, and some of these other important nutrient cycles. They're important in agriculture and understanding the ecosystem around us and how these things go from um, being broken down from organisms that have expired or taken from the atmosphere, fixed into something that can be taken up by plants and then consumed by animals up the food chain and then returned back into some usable form down the line. In addition to, um, these uh, fungi, bacteria, and archaea. We also have uh, other things. I only have one representative over on the side here of the non-fungal eukaryotes. So when we get into, again, those larger, can be either single-celled or multicellular organisms, but that have those little membrane-bound organelles, we get into what seem like critters. Even if they're single cells, sometimes they can act like critters in a way they can move around, they graze. Um, so there are things that actually graze bacteria and there are things that hunt different organisms in here. Nematodes um, do a lot of interesting things. They're like a really tiny microscopic worm. And if you garden at all, or if you are involved in any kind of um, agricultural practices, you probably don't like nematodes. They are um, a major bringer of diseases in plants and can cause a lot of trouble. And they happen to love just, you know, eating through roots and causing all kinds of destruction. So they are an interesting part of this uh, microbial community, but you need your kind of, you know, your positive and negative players to make the whole system work, right? And then we have one over here, bacteriophages. Now that's a big word. And this image possibly looks familiar to people because it looks like the very early artistic renditions of coronavirus that people accidentally put out when um, you know general public was kind of drawing what they thought a virus looked like. But those particular shapes are usually found only with things that actually plug onto um, bacteria and archaea. You don't find this particular viral envelope shape in a uh, eukaryotic virus, in a human virus or a human pathogen. And actually the virus itself is really just um, the scribble that's inside. That scribble that's inside is the DNA or the RNA depending on the type of virus. But these viruses that are called bacteriophage exclusively infect um, bacteria. And then there are those that infect archaea as well. Archaea is very similar to bacteria single-celled um, and very, very, very small, smaller than uh, eukaryotic cells, not visible to the naked eye unless it's in a big colony and a mat that you can actually see like a color or a texture, potentially perceive a smell of. Um, but both of these can be infected by um, bacteriophage, basically um, bacterial viruses. And much like viruses that affect humans, some of them can be lethal, and some of them can infect them and cause a little bit of discomfort and trouble, but not actually kill them. <laughs> so <clears throat> this is just an interesting way that uh, things are similar even on the microscopic scale to uh, the very large scale. So what do they what do they do? I was talking a little bit about their um, exchange of nutrients and their breaking down of nutrients and things like that. It's a whole long list of how these are helpful and beneficial to plants beyond just an exchange of 
I like to eat sugar and here, here's some nitrogen and some phosphorus for you between the plants and the bacteria, turns out that the bacteria actually help with primary plant functions, such as turning on or off certain pathways for development or providing key components for pathways in terms of um, hormonal development. Um, and so it can actually, who their microbial partners are, can help with the timing of how fast they grow, when they bloom, whether or not they go to seed. Um, microbiomes also exist in places like the, the flowers and they can provide different scent compounds to attract um, different pollinators to the flowers. So, and then lastly, much like the things that uh, we were talking about with the probiotics, they also boost the immune function of the plant. They can really help kind of um, mediate the effects of different stressful conditions such as heat or drought or predation, herbivory, when things are noshing on the plant. Well, the different microbes inside can actually um, help, help bolster the immune system with that. But they can help against some of the other things, such as the microbiome often recruits bacteriophages because, well, some bacteria are pathogens. They cause disease in plants. Some plant diseases are bacterial born. And so if the plant recruits little bacteriophages that it knows target the bad ones, <laughs> then it can help with the immune system in an indirect way by instead of providing something for the, the direct pathway of immunity inside the plant, it actually can just directly attack the pathogenic bacteria. Another thing is that some fungi that are recruited near and around plants actually actively hunt nematodes. So the nematode, that worm, is the little critter right there. But the lasso around it is actually a fungal thread. They set these noose traps in the soil to actually catch nematodes. So surrounding yourself with friendly fungi can help uh, not only with that wonderful nutrient exchange right at the, the uh, front, forefront there, but also can deter some of the, the, the bad pests. However, within the same community, you can have those members of the community who cause harm, who cause disease, or who impact other members. So certain bacteria species might um, increase the amount of our, um, our muscular mycorrhizal fungi around the plant, like their presence helps recruit the beneficial fungi. But sometimes a beneficial fungi might also, uh, a beneficial fungi or bacteria, its presence might enhance the effects of a disease. And so sometimes you get context, which is really important for how the, dyna the dynamics of these relationships um, actually play out. And so in addition, you know, you have your bad characters, such as those bacteria who cause root rot or things like that. Um, but sometimes the presence of uh, a pathogen or a disease carrying bacteria can also indirectly affect the plant health by affecting other members of the, the microbi microbiome community. So sometimes it can actually suppress uh, the presence of the good guys, those who were helping with development and growth and immunity and other things. Um, and so it's hard to disentangle what are the negative effects on the plant of this particular uh, uh, disruptive bacteria because is it really the direct impact of it, you know, maybe infecting plant cells and breaking them down, or is it indirect effects where it's taking away all the beneficial friends um, through either competition uh, or potentially um, a lot of these guys, they communicate and they communicate through chemical messages to each other, lots of signaling going on. And um, sometimes they can send out things that, you know, press other members of the community. Lots of things, including interactions between each other, can affect who's in the community. Um, but tons of other stuff that we know about, such as, you know, whether or not it rains, whether or not there's fog or drought. Is there fire? Okay, the community might burn, but there's also the other effects of smoke in the air and ash deposition. 
soil type effects who's there land use history was it used for agriculture or grazing that affects what microbes we're finding in the soil and therefore what microbes are available for the plants to recruit um, also we as humans we're a global species we move ourselves around the planet all the time and we move stuff around the planet all the time with us including lots of plants and potting soil and things like that and we don't always check that stuff for microbes so as non-native species make their way into our gardens and our homes and around the world into the native communities as well they bring with them non-native microbiomes and that's then an interesting interplay that's happening as well. Um, then the plant itself, this relationship between the little microbes and the plant, the microbes have preferences for what plants they like to go in. And sometimes, you know, it's just like all these other conditions. Is it too salty? Is it too acidic? Is it too basic? Is it too wet? Is it too dry? They have to find, like Goldilocks, the one that's just right. <laughs> But the plants too have preferences. Some of you guys do better working for me than others. Um, so I want these members of the community to come and live on me and in me. Uh, and so there's a lot of choice that goes on and there can be differences between the preferences of a grass species versus the preferences of a little annual or perennial flowering species, such as our little California poppy depicted here. So what do I do? I want to understand really broad patterns. When you are thinking about the nature in your backyard, if it's the plants or the birds or the lizards, usually you can go to a book or a map online, iNaturalist, and you can check out what's the range and distribution of this species. Is it rare to see here? Is it common to see here? Um, uh, what are its normal behaviors? What time of year should I be seeing it? And that way you can begin to recognize what's uh, normal, what's abnormal, um, what seems like everything's working okay, and then what seems like, oh, uh, yeah, things are not going so well. So I use California Coastal Prairie to try to look at all of these different things. And I take some material for them, I take leaves and I take roots, and I try to look for the blueprint of who's there. We don't have range distributions of bacteria and fungi. We just don't. The assumption was everything is everywhere. So I'm doing a large latitudinal gradient in California, being from north to south, to try to find out who is where, who partners with which plant, and what are all the different things that impact those partnerships and impact those relationships? And I'm doing so at a critical juncture where things are already changing, but I'm hoping to take enough snapshots over a few years of what is there, who is there, and how is it working to be able to try to predict how things might be changing and to think through things like bioremediation or conservation or after some of these events, restoration. And okay, some of the places I work in, absolutely beautiful. But this also goes to the plants we eat as well. Um, so I would like to be able to take what I learn about the interactions and the relationship dynamics between these plants and their happy little microbes and transfer that to dealing with agricultural practices in a changing climate and how we can best feed our community while we face droughts or floods or fires um, and things of that nature. So with that, I'd like to say thanks. Um, uh, and I will address any questions at this point. Great, thank you so much, Anna. Yeah, does anyone have any questions? They're free to put in the chat or So where do you go particularly for field work uh, in terms of studying? <laughs> like what, <laughs> what microbes are you studying or are you getting samples from around the state? 
so I'm focusing on California coastal prairie. Um, one of the reasons is that it's a pretty sensitive habitat, but it's also a restricted habitat. So by uh, the fact that it's only found up and down the coast, I essentially have a linear gradient that I can sample along. <laughs> um, and it has some of the things, uh, salt is a toxin uh, and really impacts who you find in the community. And with increasing drought, um, salt, uh, becomes a, a bigger threat. So even communities that are adapted to living very close to salt spray off the ocean will have um, be facing higher concentrations of salt in a drought environment in, in the coming years. Um, in addition, we are so used to that fog on the coast, particularly here in the Bay Area, and it's a, one of the primary sources of moisture in a lot of these communities. It also is where many of the microbes that inhabit the upper portion of plants is actually coming from. Um, because I did talk about soil microbes, but one of the things I neglected to mention was that the microbes that inhabit the upper portions of the plant come from rain and fog and wind, actually, that carries, you know, we all know because of our allergies, pollen and dust and other things, of course, millions of tiny microbes on it as well. And so um, how that's going to be changing. Uh, I am privileged with UC Berkeley. We have a whole bunch of reserve systems. So basically, you know, protected areas of land that I can go and do research that have climate monitoring stations. But I also am working at places um, like uh, the Air Force Base at Point Concepcion and then also Redwood National Park up in our, our past Arcata. Cool. And then you partially answered my second question which was just going to be like how yeah how like easily do microbes get distributed it seems like top level get distributed I mean through rain but I'm assuming there are other vectors as well like how big is a microbe region might be a weird way to put it but like I, are microbes like pretty ubiquitous in species or are they like generally much more contained in what's spreading them? Sorry, that's a lot of questions all wrapped in one. No, but that's exactly the point of my project is that um, for a long time, the assumption was that everything is everywhere, especially with the microbial world. Um, but, you know, if we think about it, uh, lots of things, even though we have a global distribution, we have to have different adaptations to the different climates or, or habitats that we might live in, you know, whether or not we wear coats in the winter or, <laughs> you know, have ways to deal with humidity and mold inside our houses. Again, um, the same thing, lots of different uh, microbial species have different niches. They have different preferred habitats or places that they're found. Um, and so you have the salt specialists. I intend to, I expect to find in all of my coastal prairie communities, um, many representatives of, of uh, bacteria and fungi that can tolerate higher levels of salt to begin with how they're impacted by the higher concentrations dealing with drought will be an interesting question. Some of the plants are also found on the slopes of the mid, kind of mid elevation slopes of the Sierra Nevadas. And so I intend to follow up with a comparison study of those same plant species, coastal and inland, to look then at the differences in community. Will they be similar across the same plants or will it be more um, habitat driven and you know, environmental factors? Cool. Thank you. All right. Well, I'm not seeing many questions come through the chat, but I think you are free to monitor them during Jennifer's talk. So if people do have any questions that come up, like, please feel free to ask. Uh, and Anna, I'm sure will be happy to be uh, responsive about it. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. And Oksana, I think we'll uh, introduce Jennifer. Yeah. Uh, our second speaker this evening is Jennifer, who grew up in Long Island, New York, and went to college at Wesleyan University, where she double majored in neuroscience and the science and society program, which was a combination of history, sociology, and philosophy of science. While there, she wrote a thesis on how songbirds learn their song. Currently, Jennifer is a PhD candidate in the UCSF UC Berkeley Joint Bioengineering Program. Outside of research, she enjoys painting, running, and watching movies, especially horror movies. We are very excited for your presentation. Take it away, Jennifer. Awesome. Uh, thank you so much for having me. Uh, and can everyone hear me and see everything? Cool. 
Okay, so today I'm going to be talking about some of the methods I use in my research uh, for brain network analysis. So, diagnosing and treating mental disorders is still a huge challenge, um, especially when compared to other fields of medicine. And that challenge mostly boils down to um, a lack of dependable biomarkers for the different illnesses. So when I say biomarker, I'm talking about any quantifiable characteristic that can be used to determine a disease state. An example would be if you were to show up to a doctor presenting with a cough and other symptoms of pneumonia, that doctor might send you for a scan of your lungs and then a trained radiologist would look at that image and determine if there was fluid in the lungs and that would determine your diagnosis and the treatment you receive. Psychiatry doesn't have an analog for that. So um, when somebody comes in presenting with symptoms of a mental disorder, a psychiatrist will um, assess their disease profile against symptoms in the DSM, which is just a big book of um, criteria for different mental disorders, and it'll move on from there. So some of the issues with that process include uh, the fact that it relies heavily on patient self-reporting, which is inherently subjective, of course, also there can be some uh, bias for the clinician, and there have been studies that show a high uh, prevalence of inter-rater subjectivity. Basically, the two doctors will rate a patient with different disorders. Uh, contributing to that is heterogeneity within disease classifications, meaning that uh, two different people who have been diagnosed with, say, depression could have really different lived experiences. Of that. Uh, in addition, there's also a huge overlap in symptoms between different diseases. So that's what I'm showing here on this Venn diagram to the right, which is that uh, often uh, like bipolar disorder, PTSD, and uh, major depressive disorder will all share a lot of the same symptoms. Um, so parsing that out can be kind of difficult. And that is a big motivator of my research um, with the goal of finding brain measures that correlate with these clinical symptoms. So my vision for the future of psychiatry is one in which uh, the traditional sort of uh, assessment is combined with these novel computational metrics um, to better narrow down a disease diagnosis and thus hopefully lead to better specified treatments and better outcomes for the patients. So there are a couple different approaches one can take when studying the nervous system. Uh, at the smallest scale, one could look at uh, individual cells and try to figure out what's going on chemically at the synapses there. Moving up in scale, you could look at uh, smaller networks of neurons and how those, how they connect in their patterns. Um, not just how they're connected, but also the electrical signals that they use to communicate with one another. Uh, but my research takes a macro scale approach. And what I mean by that is we are recording the entire human brain, um, dividing it into regions, like you can see here with the different colors corresponding to different uh, brain regions. And we then get signals from each of those brain regions that are translated into basically just a big groups of numbers that we apply a different mathematical analysis to um, to try to figure out what's going on. And most of the data I use in my research is from MRI 
<clears throat> which is just this big cool machine that lets us take 3D pictures of the brain non-invasively for human subjects. And there are two um, sorts of- Hey, yeah. Jennifer, um, there's just a question about um, generally, do you work with a clinic? Um, I guess one specific clinic is Dr. Amon's, but that does brain scans for help in psychiatry and psychology. Or do you get like your brain data um, from like an aggregate of many different clinics? Mm -hmm. um, so I don't work with that particular doctor you named, um, but I do get data from psychiatrists at UCSF. So actually the data I work with now is from a psychiatrist at the VA who studies psychosis. And yeah, there are also like uh, open source data sets online that combine MRI from different institutions. Okay, thank you. Yeah, yeah thank you. Um, so there are two types of data sets that I focus on primarily in my research. The first one is what we call the structural connectome. Uh, and that we get from diffusion weighted imaging, which is just a sequence of MRI. And what you're looking at here on the left, this sort of like uh, famous brain image, uh, is bundles of white matter fibers. Um, and those are actually neuron, the axons of neurons that uh, connect one part of the brain to another. So when we quantify the strength of those connections uh, between different brain regions, we end up with a matrix like what you see here on the right. The other sort of data I look at is what we call functional data. So um, in this video, you're seeing a fluctuation of brain signals over time. And uh, when we record those time series from the different brain regions. We look at the correlations between them to try to get a sense of how in sync those different brain regions are to give us an idea of how they're communicating and processing information. And then what's cool about having data in that format is that we can use uh, methods derived from graph theory to quantify different properties of those brain networks. So when I say graph, I just mean any mathematical object that represents relationships between things. So when I'm talking about the brain as a graph, I am thinking of each node as a brain region, like in that atlas that I showed earlier. And the edges represent the strength of the connections between those brain regions. So that could be functionally or structurally. And just to give an example of some of the brain, the graph metrics we might look at, uh, the first one is the clustering coefficient, which is basically a measure of how connected uh, the network is. So specifically, if you look here and you see that node one and node two are both connected to node three, what is the likelihood that one and two are also connected to each other? Another thing we think about is small worldness, which is basically an idea of um, how quickly can information flow between the different nodes of a network. So if you look at this top one, you would see that if I wanted to send signal from node one to node three, I would have to route around node two. Whereas in the graph on the bottom, one and three share a direct connection. So we would say that this graph has a higher small world index. Another thing we think about is like the rich clubbiness of a network, which is basically um, the degree to which high degree nodes preferentially connect to each other. What I mean is five and four here are both high degree nodes in the sense that they share a lot of connections um, with other nodes. And when those high degree nodes are also connected to each other, we call that a hub. And the more hubs a network has, the more uh, it's a rich club network. 
taking that one step further, um, we use the network diffusion model to probe the relationship between the structural connectome and function. Uh, so the network diffusion model is really cool. And basically, it's taken from heat diffusion. And we've shown that applying the same mathematical formula that describes the pattern of diffusion uh, in water or other things, uh, when you apply it to the structural connectome of the brain, we can actually predict what the ending pattern of that quantity will look like. Um, so when I say diffusion, basically, you know that if you have a cup of water and you were to drop some dye in it, over time, you would see that dye sort of disperse and it would reach a steady state where uh, that dye has kind of filled the whole cup. We have shown that if you can see where, say, tau, the protein that calls up, causes Alzheimer's, um, starts in one region of the brain, we can predict how that's going to spread over time. And like I said, uh, this model has been used um, to predict the profile of brain atrophy in Alzheimer's disease um, years down the line. What's also cool about this model is that you can invert it to try to figure out the original pattern of uh, pathology. So um, when one of my colleagues applied this to a group of Parkinson's disease patients, he actually discovered that uh, they fell into one of two different subtypes that have different starting patterns of pathology. And hopefully that can be used to uh, catch this earlier and treat it down the line. Um, Jennifer, sorry. Mm -hmm. um, do you guys know if those two patterns of uh, starting pathology also um, have differences in either like how fast it spread or the types of symptoms that you see first? Or um, do you not have that slightly more like psych clinical attached to uh, the brain function for those patients? Um, so that wasn't my study, so I can't speak oh. to it too much. Uh, but I do think that that is something that they're looking into is if um, the different physical subtypes also have different like symptom profiles. Okay, cool, thanks. Yep. Um, so in the healthy human brain, we see a high rich club organization, which is basically, if you look at this figure on the left, um, the bigger red balls represent brain regions that share a lot of connections with the rest of the brain. And you can think of those as uh, the hubs of the network through which a lot of the information flows. Um, and using simulations, we've seen that disruption of those connections in particular have a huge impact on other network metrics, um, such as the efficiency and uh, like that. So um, the reason that's important is in my research, we know that patients with schizophrenia show altered network metrics um, in their brains. Uh, so what you're seeing here is that um, patients, the sort of lighter blue, have um, significantly different um, clustering coefficients and uh, different brain network metrics. And also that the parts of the brain that are most affected in schizophrenia happen to be those hub regions that I was talking about earlier. What I'm currently researching is whether these can be used as biomarkers to predict who will convert to schizophrenia in the near future. Um, so the data set that I'm looking at, which I mentioned 
earlier is from um, Professor Dan Mathalon, uh, includes a group of subjects who are considered to be at clinical high risk for psychosis. Um, now, these are people who have had maybe one psychotic episode. Um, in general, they're presenting with sub-threshold changes in thoughts, of the, thoughts and behavior. We know that approximately 20 to 35% of that population will develop full psychosis over the next two years. And there's a lot of interest in trying to um, catch that early on because we know that early intervention is key to um, having better outcomes for those patients. Um, so some preliminary analysis of this data has shown that the people who do convert to psychosis, which is a CHRC, um, do seem to have reduced uh, global efficiency, uh, higher no diversity, so just different network metrics in their functional connectivity. What I'm looking at currently is whether that holds true for structural connectivity also, and um, also using that network diffusion model to see if we get any more information there. Um, and that's all I have for you today. So thanks so much for organizing this. And uh, yeah, if anyone has any questions. I don't know if this person is wanting to ask a question. Uh, I think Ethan, if you wanna put it in the chat, um, otherwise he might just be waving and saying, good job. Um, but yeah, if there are any questions, we're happy to facilitate them for a couple minutes. Um, I guess while we're waiting to see yeah. if there's a question that'll pop up in the chat, I was just curious, did you have to learn a lot about like yeah, biology and psychology and then combining it with all these like calculations? Um, like how did you find that process, I guess? Yeah, um, so my background is in sort of more traditional like biological neuroscience. Um, as I mentioned, my undergrad was like I was literally at a bench, like looking at cells under a microscope. So that was what I was most comfortable with coming into this. Um, and then starting the program, the bioengineering program, um, I did have to brush up a lot on math and kind of myself uh, coding and, and all of that to get a handle on it. But yeah. It's a pretty wide background. Are you, I, I mean, I know you talked about the two main labs that you work with, but I'm assuming, do you have to work with a broad amount of collaborators to get all of this various data? And then a slightly more technical question, the videos that you showed, which were like functional, it, are you mostly using calcium signaling or are you using a larger range of like neuro signaling molecules? to look at for these studies? Yeah, so the video that I showed for functional imaging uh, was derived from fMRI Bold, which is uh, looking at the change in blood oxygenation in the brain regions, which we think of as like correlated to higher metabolic activity in that region, um, which we hope is a proxy for neural activity. Um, and then the first question, yeah, we are basically a lab that like other people collect the data and we analyze it. So we yeah, completely depend on collaborator relationships and open source data sets. Cool, thanks. And so uh, Lizzie, one of our attendants has a question, which is what is the threshold for a cluster to become a hub on the graph? At what point do you decide this cluster is big enough, we call it a hub. Um, you can kind of vary it. Like, uh, 
sometimes you'll see in a graph, people are like, okay, using th this threshold, uh, this network has like this index. Um, and like, obviously the more stringent you are with that, the more robust your results are. So you kind of just maybe guess and check a little bit at which level one becomes a hub to when yeah. hubs kind of fit a bit more of that functional data? I um, wish I could give like an exact number, but basically you would say like, like the same way you're just, when you decide like statistical significance, uh, you would say like, this is significant at a threshold of like 0.05. Um, so like people will say with a threshold of X, we see that this network has a rich club metric of Y. <laughs> uh, so I think it's a little gotcha. Okay, cool. And then we have, uh, yeah, one more question um, from Ethan. Is the speed of computers a big limiting factor on what you can analyze or figure out? Yeah. Yeah, it really is, um, especially because the data that we're working with is huge sometimes. Like, you know, just uh, the structural connectome of a single subject can be uh, too much for my computer to handle basically the processing. So then when you're trying to do the analysis of hundreds of subjects, we actually have a computational core in the radiology department. Jobs too. But yeah, it could take a while. Okay, great. Uh, well, I think that's all the questions that we currently have. So thank you very much to both of our speakers uh, for being here and uh, for giving such great talks tonight. We're very happy to have you join us. And thank you so much too. Um, best wishes to everyone as um, you all transition to a new school year, school year. And thank you so much for speaking and thank you so much for bringing this program to the library tonight. Have a great day and see you all next month. Thanks so much for having us.